Well, please do take a seat, and as you do so, it would be really helpful if you could pick up your Bibles and turn to uh, page 981, back to Philippians 2. It's a a real privilege to be uh, with you this evening, and uh, I bring the greetings and uh, the prayers and the love of uh, the church family at Holy Trinity Gateshead. Uh, It really is a joy uh, to be with you this evening. Now, as we come back to Philippians uh, this evening, we might wonder... Um, what the travel plans of some men who lived some 2,000 years ago have got to do with us today. Well, certainly when I read this passage to start with, I was thinking, well, you know, Paul's going to send Timothy, he's going to send Epaphroditus, wonderful, that's, that's lovely for them. What's that really uh, going to say and teach us today? It, it seems a little bit of a crunch through the gears, doesn't it, from the rest of chapter 2, uh, from all the great encouragements to live with the mindset of Christ that you've been thinking about over the past few Sundays. But as we slow down and take a closer look, we'll see that Timothy and Epaphroditus are living examples of the kind of lifestyle that Paul has been encouraging and urging his readers towards in the rest of the letter. They model for us what a self-giving service of others shaped by the love of Jesus really looks like. And I think that's the kind of love we would love to have for others and show to others. And it sounds great, doesn't it? But what does it really look like in practice? What what does it really mean to live with this kind of sacrificial love? What does it mean to shine as light in the world, as Paul urged us to do in last week's passage, back in chapter 2, verse 15? Now, perhaps you're here this evening as a student who's about to head home for the summer, and you're wondering, well, how can I live distinctly for Jesus as I head home over the summer months? Or perhaps you're about to graduate and head to a new town or a new city. What will it mean for you to shine brightly for Jesus there? Well, that's what we're going to be thinking about together this evening. In a sense, if you like, last Sunday, uh, as we thought about uh, chapter 2, verses 12 to, to 16, Paul was encouraging us to consider the world as like a night sky, a dark place where Christians are called to shine brightly for him. And this evening, he kind of picks up the telescope and he focuses in on two particularly bright shining stars for us to learn from, uh, two particular examples in Timothy and Epaphroditus. So this evening we're going to be thinking about what it means to shine like Timothy, serving others, what it might mean to shine like Epaphroditus, suffering for others, but also what it means to shine like Paul, sending on to others. Now, we might be uncomfortable with human examples, you know, putting people on a pedestal, and we do have to be wary of that, don't we? They're flawed human examples like you and me. Uh, So it's important for us to remember that all that we see in them, it it hasn't come from within them, but from them being united with the Lord Jesus. Timothy, Epaphroditus, and Paul demonstrate in in this passage all the characteristics that come from being in Christ Jesus. Remember, that's what uh, Paul said back in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Everything we see and learn of them this evening comes from knowing and being united with Jesus. So at some level, although they're special, and it's right that Paul singles Timothy and Epaphroditus out for us so that we can learn from them, they point beyond themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. And at another level, well, actually, they shouldn't be special, should they? Because each and every Christian is called to live out this same mindset, to have the same mindset that is ours in Christ Jesus too. Well, let's think about Timothy, Timothy first. What might it mean to shine like Timothy, serving others? This is in verses 19 to 24. Now, at some level, it's a little bit odd that this section is here at all because the Philippian church knew Timothy pretty well. He, he's listed as one of the writers of the letter back in chapter 1, verse 1. 
Uh, He was there when the church began. You can read all about that in Acts chapter 16. And even in today's section, it says, verse 22, you know his proven worth. So this is a guy the church in Philippi know really, really well. So so why does Paul need to kind of say anything about him at all? Can't he just say, I'm going to send Timothy to you? And they'll know that's going to be a great encouragement. But of course, sometimes we can be so familiar with someone that we miss the detail of what they're really like, can't we? Uh, Perhaps we take their character for granted instead of seeing it for what it truly is. Uh, It's a bit like when you drive past some scenery day after day. It can be the most beautiful scenery in the world, but you can begin to just take it for granted if it's just there day in, day out. And so Paul wants to highlight this evening in bright yellow highlighter, underlined with thick black ink, the incredible work that Jesus has been doing in the life of Timothy so that we really don't miss it, uh, so we don't miss, miss the encouragement of it. Let's have a look at verses uh, 19 and 20 with me. I-, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Uh, Paul's effectively saying, look, I'm sending you the best, the best that I have, someone who's going to come to you, not looking out for himself, but pouring himself out, spending his time, his energy, investing in your growth and in helping you to grow in your love of Jesus. He's not going to come seeing what he can uh, get from you, He's not going to come seeking power and influence for himself. He's he's not coming to make his name great among you. He's not in it for the money or for the gifts that you might give him. No, he's not even in it to make friends. He is there to seek your good. That's what he's going to come and do among you. And I don't know about you, but I find that a challenge. That's a challenge for us, isn't it? It's so easy, isn't it, to turn up at church or at our home group, or at our student group, thinking, well, what's in it for me? What what am I getting out of this? Is the music style to my taste? Am I being really well fed? Now, of course, this is the kind of cultural air we breathe, isn't it? We're so used to everything being tailored to our own individual preferences. Just think about when you go to the coffee shop, how many options there are to tailor your coffee to your particular wants and needs. I love the Grande Extra Hot Wet Latte from Starbucks. I'm sure you've got your own preference. It's shaped around us, isn't it? Everything for us. But the problem is, if that's the attitude that we come to church with, well, then no one gets to experience the kind of love and unity that the gospel creates, do they? Who cares for others if we're all looking towards our own needs and interests? Well, no one. So the key question is, how do we move from an inward, me-centered attitude to one that is other-centered, selfless, sacrificially putting the needs of others first? The answer lies in our verses today, but only as we compare them with the command back in chapter 2, verse 4. You see, there's a deep connection back to what Paul has already written. And we need to grasp this this evening if we're really going to embody the love of Christ to others. So have a look back to chapter 2, verse 4 with me. Paul writes this, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, I want you to keep looking at that verse as I read chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. And see what they set you up to expect from these verses. Chapter 2, verses 20 and 21 say this, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of... How are we expecting that verse to finish? Having looked at chapter 2, verse 4. For they all seek their own interests, not those of others. That's what we're expecting, isn't it? That was the command. Look to the interests of others. But that's not what chapter 2, verse 21 says, is it? They all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Here is the key principle that we need to grasp this evening 
if we're going to learn to live our lives in service of others, and that is to serve others, is to serve Christ. To serve others is to serve Christ, if we're doing it for the glory of his name. We don't have to make a choice between our own personal relationship with Jesus and growth and serving others. The, the two aren't kind of opposed to each other. No, they, they come hand in hand. To serve others is to serve Christ. And on the flip side, uh, to seek our own interests and not the interests of others is to fail to serve Christ. It is to fail to be like Christ and to love like him, isn't it? After all, he gave himself in the ultimate demonstration of self-giving service. As he gave himself to die on the cross for you and for me. He laid down his life for us on the cross. If we want to serve him and if we're going to serve him, it means loving others in that kind of a way. Because if you're a Christian here this evening, you are intimately connected to every other Christian. We are all in Christ, united with him and therefore united with one another. That's an inescapable fact, an inescapable reality of the gospel. So if that's the case, if we're united with one another, it would be foolish, wouldn't it, to ignore one another's needs? Not to worry about what others are going through? It would be like ignoring a part of your own body. So here's the challenge for us this evening. Every time we walk through those doors to come to church, could we be thinking, not I wonder what I'm going to receive today, but who, who could I serve today? Who is it that needs me to draw alongside them, uh, to encourage them, to rejoice with them, to mourn with them, to meet up with them? And over the summer months, is there someone that needs some encouragement as they head home to a non-Christian family? Perhaps you know of a student who's going to be heading into a pretty tricky situation as they head back for the summer to a church where they're going to be more isolated from others of their own age. Could you send a message to them at some point over uh, the next few weeks or, or offer to have a video call with them on a, on a regular basis to keep encouraging them in their faith? Or even perhaps you could go and visit to help and encourage them to keep going with Jesus. It may well be costly for you, costing you some time, energy, effort, money, but what a great encouragement for them. So let's shine like Timothy, serving others. And let's shine like Epaphroditus, suffering for others. We, whilst we might have heard of Timothy before, Epaphroditus is probably less familiar to us all. Uh, but he wasn't uh, less familiar to the Philippians. He was actually a member of the Philippian church. Uh, and as far as we can tell, he'd been sent by the Philippians to Paul in Rome to take them a significant financial gift. In chapter 4, verse 18, uh, we read this. I have received full payments and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. You see, Epaphroditus had gone as the church's representative to Paul. And it's clear, isn't it, from the way he's described by Paul in today's verses that it wasn't just kind of some slave or kind of helper sent to take the money. No, he's actually gone to work alongside Paul as a partner in the gospel, to work alongside Paul proclaiming and sharing the good news of Jesus, to encourage Paul whilst he's in prison. Just look at verse 25 and how Paul describes him. I've thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my needs. 
These are intimate terms, aren't they? His brother, his fellow worker, a fellow soldier. The fact that he describes Epaphroditus in such positive terms means that Paul clearly has been blessed by him and has seen him as a faithful co-worker in the gospel. But for the the Philippians, it has been a time of anxiety for their dear friend, hasn't it? Verse 26, we read this, He has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him. Now, just put your shoes, yourself in the shoes of the Philippian church for a moment. The journey from Philippi to Rome is uh, about uh, 700 miles. It would have taken around uh, six weeks, uh, or between, uh, between six weeks and three months, depending on the conditions. Not a short journey to make. You've sent one of your own congregation to go and support the gospel work that you're partnering with. You've sent a significant financial gift that you know is so desperately needed. And then you get the message back that the one you've sent is seriously ill. How are you going to be feeling? Pretty anxious, pretty worried, aren't you? But now imagine you're Epaphroditus. I know that my natural instinct would probably be to worry about myself. Am I going to be okay? I feel pretty rough at the moment. I hope I come through this. But how does Epaphroditus feel in the midst of his illness? What is he thinking about? Verse 26. He has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. (laughs) He's not worried about himself. He's deeply concerned about the church he so dearly loves. In our translation here, it says he was distressed. It's more literally, he was out of his mind with worry. Here again is a man who is more concerned about the welfare of others than he is himself. But why? What what is it that stirs such passion and concern in him? it's, It's driven by the gospel, isn't it? Verse 30. He nearly died... For the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. The very reason that Epaphroditus got ill in the first place was because he was undertaking a mission that was, in effect, for the Lord Jesus. And he was so committed to it that he nearly died for the work of Christ. Perhaps if he'd turned back or given up the journey sooner, he wouldn't have been in such an unfit state when he made it to Paul. We don't know. But why was it he risked his life? Because he got what we were talking about earlier. He knew that to serve others was to serve Christ. He knew that as he went on this journey, he was taking the whole encouragement of the Philippian church with him. He represented the church to Paul. And that's where this odd phrase at the end of verse 30 comes in. Uh, When Paul writes that he was risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me, I I don't think Paul's being grumpy and saying, hey, couldn't you have done more, guys? He was being realistic. They couldn't all possibly go and be with Paul, could they? But Epaphroditus could. He knew that if he could only get to Rome, if he could just make it through, it would be such an encouragement to Paul. It would fuel him for the long road ahead. So he put himself on the line. If with Timothy we saw that to serve others is to serve Christ, with Epaphroditus we see that to suffer for others is to suffer for Christ. And we should honour and celebrate those who do. That's what Paul encourages us towards, isn't it? Verse 29, receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. You see, the people we celebrate, the stories that we tell, shape the characteristics that we think are important. And so we should celebrate and honor those who are willing to take risks for the sake of serving others. 
and for the sake of the Lord Jesus. We should celebrate those who are suffering in the middle of it all, but are not thinking about themselves, but about others and their good. I just want to share, we've been so blessed by a number of families at Holy Trinity Gateshead as we've made the move from Sheffield to join them in the last couple of months. And you know what? There are so many who have their own particular struggles for whom family life is not particularly easy at the moment, but who have really put themselves out to help me and the rest of my family settle in our new church family. And what a blessing, what a joy, what an encouragement that has been. They could have gone, well, hey, look, life's hard, it's busy, we haven't really got time. But no, they've put themselves out to love and care and support us as we've made that move. And that has had such an impact on us. So that me encourage you to think about how you can do the same for others. That brings us to our final and much briefer point this evening. And that is that we should also shine like Paul, sending on to others. Paul's in a pretty tough situation, isn't he? He's in prison. He's suffering for the sake of the gospel. And I'm sure as we think about it, he really could have done with these great guys, Timothy and Epaphroditus, sticking around, couldn't he? To encourage him in his gospel work. But instead, he sends them. Now, this is instructive for us too, isn't it? Sometimes looking out for the interests of others doesn't actually mean we ourselves have to go. It might actually mean being willing to send others to do gospel work, whether that's short-term, like Timothy, or long-term, like Epaphroditus. But let's also be clear. It is costly. Paul described both of these men with great affection, didn't he? Timothy, he described uh, like a son. Epaphroditus, he described as a brother and fellow worker. It's costly. Just because you're not going doesn't mean you don't feel the loss. Now, it may be that some of you here this evening were here when HTG uh, or St. Joseph's Joseph's Benwell were planted. And you will know that it was really costly (laughs) saying goodbye to friends, sending them on to do gospel work in another part of uh, this area. What a great joy it is as well. That there are now three churches in the area serving different communities, reaching more people with the good news of Jesus. So friends, we we must continue to be willing to take gospel risks, to bear the cost of sending on to others for the sake of making the good news of Jesus known, both locally and around the world. And in a sense, that's what happens every year here at JPC as students who've been here for three, four, or even five years are sent on to new places, having grown in faith. Having been involved in student ministry back in Sheffield, I know it's a great joy, but it's also really costly. Because if that's you this evening, you're about to move on, you're a dearly loved member of the church family here. And so it's going to be hard to say goodbye. But it's also really exciting. Because as you go, you've got new opportunities to share your faith and to encourage other believers in another part of the world, wherever the Lord takes you in the months and the years ahead. And look, even if you're just heading back home for the summer, there are exciting opportunities to share the gospel with friends and family members too, aren't there? Or to encourage young believers on summer camps. And so it's our privilege to send you with our love and our prayers to shine for Jesus there. And if you're staying, it's our privilege to shine for Jesus wherever the Lord has placed us this week in our work, in our homes. And let me pray that we would do that. Let's pray together now.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the men and women who have shared the good news of Jesus with us. Thank you for those that you have put in our lives who have encouraged us to keep going when we've felt weary and drained. Heavenly Father, please would you help us to be those who shine brightly for Jesus and like Jesus. Lord, grow in us a desire to seek first the glory of Jesus in all that we do and the good of his people. Forgive us for the times when we've been slow. And by your spirit, change us and make us more like Christ, we pray. For your most glorious name's sake. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to close our time together by standing and singing uh, for the Lord to be our vision as we sing our final song together. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>